I'm going to talk about uh, really the intersection of uh, this very cutting edge science with a very practical and in some ways very old fashioned world. And that's the uh, world of vaccines and particularly influenza vaccines. Uh, I'll describe initially how uh, literally as we speak, you know, synthetic biology is transforming influenza vaccines. While I was sitting in the audience, I got a uh, email uh, notifying me that the World Health Organization is now making uh, four uh, potential vaccine viruses available to manufacturers uh, for the H7N9 uh, outbreak. Three of those four viruses are made with synthetic uh, genes, uh, some which were supplied by Novartis for distribution throughout uh, the World Health Organization organization. And the, the remaining one is not made by traditional technology either. It's just a wild type virus. So I think to get some background on how insignificant that is, we have to look at where this started. So flu vaccines are incredibly old fashioned. Really, they started back in the 30s and 40s of the last century when people realized you could grow a flu virus in eggs. In the 1960s, there was actually a real period of innovation. Leading scientists worked on flu vaccines in the 1960s, and they really innovated. They learned that you don't just have to kill the whole virus and put it into people because that's reactogenic. You could extract the key antigens from it. They learned that you could purify them much more efficiently on big, on big preparative ultracentrifuges. They learned that you could make the strains grow better by mating them, traditionally by co-infecting eggs with more than one virus at once and taking the progeny that came out. And then pretty much innovation stopped for about 40 years. And people just kept making them the same way. The way you made them was enshrined in regulation. You're not allowed to make them differently. That's, parts of that are still true today. You, many of you probably read about the uh, disappointing effectiveness of the flu vaccine uh, this past year for the 2012-13 Northern Hemisphere campaign. The reason was manufacturers, even those that made vaccines with modern cloning and other techniques and could have made a vaccine that matched the circulating strains were required to make a vaccine that matched egg adaptive strains. In the process of egg adaptation, those viruses lost their antigenic cross-reactivity with the circulating strains. So by regulation, we had to make a mismatched vaccine. So this is the world into which synthetic biology is coming. The biggest thing that's, that's happened recently is, well, in 2007, Europe licensed a vaccine that could be made in cell culture rather than in eggs. In 2000 and late 2012, the US, for the first time, licensed a flu vaccine that's not made in eggs. And that, that's uh, flu cell vax, which, which, which we make. The introduction and the real realization and the public impetus to change this system really came in 2009 with the H1N1 pandemic. And in some ways, we're very proud of what we did during that pandemic. It was the fastest vaccine development effort in history. In about the course of less than six months, so we developed three licensed influenza vaccines, got them to market, and distributed them. But by any reasonable me standard, it was too slow. In black, you have the peak of disease in the United States during the second pandemic wave, not the first one. It was the one that came after, the, went down for the summer, came up in the fall when the kids went back to school. Here was the vaccine supply. Vaccine supply came after the second pandemic peak. Now, H1N1 turned out to be not that virulent, but this is a strategy of immunizing the survivors, not a strategy of immunizing people to prevent a pandemic. So clearly we had to do better. And, it, and we knew that at the time. The standard way that a vaccine manufacturer makes a flu vaccine against a new strain, the first step is you wait by your mailbox. And you wait, and you wait, and eventually the World Health Organization will send you a virus to make. October, or well, April 24th, 2009, well, my boss, uh, Rima Rapoli, got a, uh, had a meeting with the head of BARDA, you serve US, serve, uh, HHS Associated Serve Biodefense Agency, saying, there have been a couple of cases of this H, uh, H1N1 in the US. We think this is, could be the start of the next pandemic. You guys have all these contracts to respond to pandemics? Respond. Um, and we decided we weren't going to just wait by our mailbox. We would try to make our own virus, not go through the WHO network. Well, we started off trying to get the gene synthesized. And well, actually, we did get it synthesized. And I'll tell you, that actually didn't work within the, a reasonable time frame. We got the genes, but making the virus for the genes, it took longer to get it right, uh, to, to, too long to get it to be useful. But the CDC did send us viral RNA. And although we'd only had one graduate student, basically in Siena, Italy, who'd been working with reverse genetics, we built a reverse genetic system. And we got the first potential vaccine virus in the world about 17 days uh, into 
of that outbreak hitting the US. Couldn't use it, wasn't made under GMP. We went to our colleagues at the University of Marburg uh, in Germany and in their BSL-4 lab, which operates under very high uh, strict quality standards, strict kinds of environmental monitoring, we made something that would have been GMP. The WHO network delivered us a virus just, just a few days earlier than that. And we realized at that time, if the whole apparatus out there that's designed to make flu viruses and get them to you, you can actually design your system, you can make it GMP in the same amount of time that the existing system takes, why are you using the system? Why not just do it yourself? So after that, we decided that's what we do. We didn't exactly do it. I've already talked about this. We didn't exactly do it ourselves. We, 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 we phoned a friend. Uh, we've been working for a long time with the J. Craig Venner Institute and his newly formed organization, the uh, Synthetic Genomics Vaccines Inc., using genomics, not synthetic biology, uh, to make vaccines. And we decided, well, let's work with him to try to, and his group, to try to make a better uh, way to make uh, flu uh, vaccine viruses. So we, with, with the, the assistance of BARDA, uh, we started a collaboration and came up with a system. Basically, after relevant HA and NA sequences are uh, found, you design the oligonucleotides, you synthesize them. I know there's old hat to, to a lot of people here. You assemble them into HA and NA genes, rescue them in a, a manufacturing cell line, amplify them, and then pick the ones you want to use to make the vaccine. It sounds straightforward, but when we first tried it, it really didn't work very well, and I'll get into that. And there has been a lot of optimization to improve the speed, to improve accuracy, which has been critical, and I'll describe that in more detail. Once you can make any virus you want, why not make one that really yields a lot of hemagglutinin in so that you can make a lot of vaccine with it? So we designed superior backbones, and we showed robustness. I say greater than 25. I'm sure we're well over 50 strains at this point. And now what's not here is we're starting to automate the system. The core of the system is uh, an update on uh, Gibson synthesis. Basically, it takes us 10 hours to go from oligonucleotides to a uh, error-corrected uh, synthetic gene. It takes us less than one day to go from a sequence on the web to that synthesized gene. And the critical part of this turns out to be getting the accuracy right. So this was the state of the art when we started. It was about five days to get a synthetic gene that was reliable enough that you could make a virus with it. And the core problem was you could synthesize fast or you could synthesize accurately. You couldn't do both. And as a lot of you know, the, the, the core problem is in the chemical synthesis. You, it has an error rate. Fortunately, those errors are characteristic. They are typically a deletion. You have failure of coupling in flow of your reaction. And once you get up to the size of uh, you know, a couple of kilobases, the size of an HA or NA gene, as it turns out, if you just take this process and you just try and go straight through it, you get about 3% of the HA or NA genes are correct. And that's not enough. So instead, what you do is, you know, you, a lot of you have done this, I know. You pull the oligonucleotide. I mean, we're all synthetic biologists here. We engineer yep. cells here. Um, yep. So what about engineering the cell that actually make yeah. the virus? Do you yeah, think so, so, yeah, so, so we, we do work on that. So the, the cells that we grow this on are a uh, uh, MDCK cell line that's been adapted to growth and suspension. And it can be engineered to be better. The regulatory barriers to changing a manufacturing cell line are huge. So scientifically, that is an absolutely straightforward task. From a regulatory point of view, is a very difficult task because a cell is a hard to define thing. So proving that that cell is safe, not if you're making a cancer drug, but if you're making a vaccine that you want to put into every healthy person in the world, saying that that cell is safe enough to do it. So yes, we're pursuing that. Uh, it's not going to happen fast, not because of the science, but because of all the safety concerns around doing anything to modify a cell line. It, I forget how many years. It took well over a decade to, to get that cell line uh, approved for but for human use. Okay, Newbar. Yeah. Yeah, Newbar Fain from Flagship Ventures. I wanted to know uh, why you need to replicate the mRNA in these cells. Do you know if just the RNA without ap amplification can yeah. make enough antigen? And also, yeah. are your lipid particles important to which cells take them up? And do you know which cells take them up? Sure, no, the, uh, on both questions. You can make uh, uh, just simple mRNA that does not replicate, and you do get immune responses. Uh, we've not done real careful side-by-side. -side. Yes, we have. Uh, internally, you, you get a better immune response if it replicates. So it's, it's possible to do it without it, but, but you get, get more of an immune response. And in terms of what cells are being delivered to, we don't know precisely. You know, we inject intramuscularly. 
And so certainly we see uptake in muscle cells, but we can't say for sure that the important immune response is the immune response to what's been taken up into muscle as opposed to maybe a few dendritic cells that are scattered in the muscle. So we know it gets taken up in muscle after intramuscular injection. It's possible it could be taken up by other cell types, and that could be important as well. So sorry to just follow up on that and dwell on the biology a little bit. Um, so how's the, so they're taking up into the endosome, and are they using some property of the RNA to get out of the endosome? Or do you know? Yeah. So we, we don't even know for sure that it's going endosomally. I, I think it's a pretty good assumption, but it is an assumption, not, okay. not, not sure knowledge. Um, and we have not engineered the RNA intentionally uh, for release from endosomes. Uh huh. Interesting. Yeah. You yeah. probably do that. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. Yeah. Sure. Thank you a lot. Okay. So.